All right, I'm going to have to move as quickly as I know how and uh, to be where we need to be. I'm going to need all the time that I can get. I want to ask this question. If you are a born-again believer, that means you have trusted uh, God with all of your heart uh, that Christ is your Savior, would you just raise your hand where I could see who you are if you have? Amen. God bless you if you trusted Christ as your Savior. Put your hands down. Now, I did that because I wanted to validate. I never want to take the assumption uh, that everyone is saved. But I, I do know that not everyone is saved, but I think the majority of the audience is a, is a redeemed audience here this morning. And I always try to make the gospel the emphasis of what we're doing, and, and you'll find that in what I'm going to say today, because I'm really speaking to the, to the heart of the matter. And I've titled today's message or instruction, A Kitchen Window's View. Because I think one thing as born-again believers that we really do not know how to do, and, and, and don't get offended by this, because in reality, I, 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 I'm, I'm speaking from my heart because I've tried to search my own heart on this. We don't know how to worship very well. We just don't. We, we try to find a path to it, but we don't know how to do it. Matter of fact, we have to have worship leaders to help us get to where we need to be. Amen. So I want to help you this morning uh, in the discovery of what really worship is really about. And I want you to listen intently because it's a time of teaching. Uh, I'm not going to really be preaching. We've preached hard for the last four or five weeks. I want to teach you something about worship. Because I think if you can get this, you will understand uh, about your relationship with God uh, in, in a much bolder way. Because if you're born again, the very issue that should be uh, the forefront and the foremost thing in your life, if you're born again, should be your worship. If you don't worship God, then you really don't know God. Because when you know God, you will absolutely, because of your transformed heart, will see Him as a being that absolutely should be worshipped. So it's one of the deeper things that I've tried to bring, and I wrestled with it, I'll be honest. I wrestled with it because I, I, I didn't want to try to make it above someone's head, and I don't think it will be that way. If you'll listen to what I'm going to say here this morning, I think it will transcend and transform you uh, to where we, we get a better glimpse on what we should do. I'm going to start with a little clip on worship. This is very basic. What I'm about to say uh, can, can, be, uh, can be kind of startling. For some of us. Um, and let me just say this, this as I contemplated. When I worship, I would rather my heart be without words than my words be without heart. Let me say that again. When I worship, I would rather my heart be without words than my words to be without heart. Watch the clip and then I'll be back and I'll talk about a kitchen window's view. A kitchen window's view. To me, worship is breathing. To me, worship is a lifestyle. Anything we do that says to God, you are God. A worship is what you do when you go out to the community, when you're around your friends. Me wanting to be what he wants me to be. Adoration. Aside from prayer, worship is my high-speed connection to God. Worship is about our heart when we bring it to Him. When I'm truly worshiping, my heart is overcome with thankfulness. I am vulnerable. I'm completely engulfed. I'm completely in tuned to to God. Oh, you just speaking to God with the lyrics, the words, and, and God speaks back to you. I want it to be from me. I want to abandon all modesty and just, just worship my God. God can have a personal experience in worship with everyone in that room. And so it, it's almost like a conversation with God, almost a prayer. When I worship, I want God to be magnified. 
When I worship, I want God to be pleased. I want God to be front and center. I want God to laugh with me. I want God to be happy. When I worship, I want God to be lifted up. I want there to be a knowing that Crystal came and she brought all of her and she was sincere. I want him to be exalted. I want him to be in the spotlight. I want him to be the focus. I want him to have the rightful place that only he deserves in my life. When I worship, I want God to be my friend. And I want him to know how thankful and grateful I am for all the things that he's done for me. I want him to feel the joy that is in my heart because I'm so grateful to him because he sent his son to die for me. I think the title will, will, will speak volumes if you'll listen to what I'm going to say. A kitchen window's view is uh, anytime you build a house, I always hear uh, people talk about, from my kitchen window, I want this incredible view. And uh, Phyllis and I, we have a, a place we, we sneak off to at the lake, and from the window we can see the view, and it's absolutely beautiful. How many of you can relate when I'm saying, I want to be able to see outside, and I, I, I want this beautiful view from my kitchen window? Uh, it, it's important. I don't know why it's important. We don't ever say, I want this view of other rooms, but in the kitchen we seem to want this view where we can see the kids, where we can bring the outside in, where we can do all of these things, and it's just something about that view that, that, uh, that we love. We want, it, we want to see it beautiful, whether it be the flowers, the trees, the lake, the, the atmosphere, or whatever it is, we, we want to uh, look at it and we want it to affect us. We want it to be something that's good. When it comes to worship, I think this is the view that many of us want. We want to stand on the inside and gaze out and see the beauty of God and all that God has done. And it's magnificent. And there absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that, except that's not scriptural. There's nothing wrong with it. I think in our humanness, that's where we're safe. As we look out and we see God and we see the expanse that God has made and the beauty of His creation, and all of it testifies that there's a God. But in Revelation chapter number 3, you're going to see the verse on the screen. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now again, this is the verse that comes in the book of Revelation of the church age, the last church, as He writes letters, or the Holy Spirit has written letters to the seven churches representative of the historical views of how the churches have uh, progressed through the ages. And the last church is the church of Laodicea, and it's a cold, lukewarm church that says, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Well, in that chapter, and again, I'm not going to preach on that, but there's a verse, in verse 20 it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. The scriptural view of the church in the last day should be that we open the door and let Christ in instead of standing at the kitchen window looking out and again saying how beautiful it all is, but we really don't want God to come in and have that personal time with us. He said, I'll come in and dine with you. I don't know about your dinner, but at the dinner table is where we talk about everything. At the dinner table is where we make plans and where we laugh and where we fellowship together. Not at the kitchen window looking out, talking about how good it is, but bringing Him in and letting Him in, you experience the personal attributes of God that transform you. And your relationship is now a close relationship with God instead of a distant relationship with God. Are, are you following me now? Because I believe the majority of the people... In our casualness, because of the, the, the day and age in which we live, there's so much negative going on. We're very protective. We're even protective when it comes to our spiritual walk. And we stand and we say it's great. We say it's good. We say the church is good. We say the preaching's good. And we say all this. But in reality, what happens is what I'm about to say next. And you might not like it, but, I, but I'm going to say it. Can I get an amen? Because in the average church service... The most real thing is the shadowy unreality of everything. 
the worshiper sits in a state of suspended mentation. We're not sure what to do. Do we raise our hands? Do we weep? We stand there not sure of what to do, even though the songs or the message has such profound meaning, we still don't know what to do. The worshiper sits, and he, it's kind of a dreamy numbness that creeps upon him or her. He hears words, but they don't really register. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now help me here. Surely I'm not the only one that feels this sometimes. We feel and we hear, but we sometimes don't know what to do. They don't register. We cannot relate to anything that's really being said about the song, or if we do get part of it, it's from a kitchen window view instead of an open door view where we say, Lord, just come on in and have your way with me. Can I get an amen? That's how we view it. Again, there's nothing wrong with saying how beautiful everything is. But when we do that, we miss out on the closeness of what God really requires of us. In Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 32 and 33 Um, I'll give you verse 32, and it says, And the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. See, when the church gathers to worship, it also gathers to witness. And it says there was great grace and there were one heart and one soul. I think what's missing sometimes, as I said, we're all believers. And again, I told you I'm going to teach you a little deeper and some of you have clamored for this. Give me something that's, that's above what I've, I've ever heard. And I think sometimes what's missing is that we, are all, we all say we're believers, but we all have not given the liberty, the liberty to God to totally come in and transform us. It's beautiful, looks good, sounds good. I hear the words, but I'm not sure what the words are really supposed to get me to do because I've really never let him in. I only have this view. Now, I know I'm speaking to people here this day. And the only way that you're going to have the relationship with God that you're supposed to have is, he says, I stand at the door and knock. You've got to open the door. And you've got to let him in. I'm not talking about salvation. All of you basically said you're redeemed. I'm teaching you how to have that intimate time with God that will transform your life. God's more than just praying a prayer. God's more than just checking a box and saying, I'm a church member. God's more than just something we do on Sunday. God is something we do all the time. Understand what I'm saying. And see, when the church gathers to worship, it gathers to witness, and that witness is threefold. It's to the Lord, it's to the church, and it's to the world. And we come together, balanced worship includes celebration, edification, and proclamation. It just doesn't come uh, include that you come and you sit and you hear. When you come and you sit and you hear, then you'll be led to do and to proclaim and to be a witness, these cover, uh, these cover the three main areas of life worship. It's private, it's public, and it's corporate. We come together, we ought to be rocking the top off this place. In worship. And we, we, we do it corporately. But not just when we come here, we should do it in the public, and we should certainly do it when we're in private. Our private time. Our, our time when we're out in public, and then we come together, we ought to be lifting the roof off the place because it bears witness. When you worship, it makes it easier for me to worship. When I see that you've let him in, it makes it easier for me to open the door and let him in. When I see that you're not crazy, I'll, I won't have the fear and I'll let him in, and I won't be crazy. Amen? Amen? Instead of saying, oh, it looks good. Song's good, Justin. Good music, praise team. They don't sing to entertain. They sing to lead you to a place of worship. I don't preach just to give you knowledge. It'll just puff you up. I preach to transform your life with the Word of God through the Holy Spirit that will allow you to open the door and let Him in. And that forces change, but we stand at the window and we look, and it's beautiful, and it's safe, and God is awesome, and the church is good, but we're still looking at it that way, and we're not having that intimate time with God. So what do we do? See, what we've been doing privately all week long, we should do publicly as we gather with the people of God on the Lord's day. 
And if we've been void of private worship, then our public worship will suffer. What you do in private will transform into public. And what you do in public will come together in a corporate atmosphere that you just can't contain yourself. You and I bring to the service our own spiritual contribution of blessing. If I stand before you Sunday after Sunday and I've not had private time with God and not been moved by God, not studied my Bible, not been in prayer, not been in an attitude of worship, it will be very evident to me and I will not affect you in any way with what I say. You expect me to be in that state all the time. Just say amen. You expect my sermon this week to be as good or better than last week's. Just say amen. You expect it to be at a high level that speaks to you. And in return, I should expect and God should respect that you in turn worship and respond to what is given so that you can let him in and just stand and instead of standing looking saying it's beautiful, it's good, I like that. Because the whole purpose of it all is not to entertain. The purpose of it all is to transform your life. Amen. Those who come with no spiritual preparation at all need to be ministered to. But often they don't admit, nor do they even see the need that something is missing in their life. And see, when we get to that place, then what we've got is just religion. What we've got is formalism, it's religion... And we're coming for moral ethics, and we're coming out of duty instead of out of gratitude. We come to worship out of gratitude. That's what worship is. It's gratitude. Just a reminder, God doesn't need our worship. Acts 17.25 says, Nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now that's Paul's address on the Areopagus on Mars Hill, speaking to the great philosophers, reminding them God does not need our worship. God doesn't need our worship, but He does seek our worship and invites us into His presence. John 4.23 says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Is that on the screen? It is on the screen. It's not on the screen. Not on the screen. I forgot. That's just my introduction. He don't have that. John 4, 23. Let me read it again. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking to worship Him. And the point of this, the point of God seeking is the transformation. God knows every time we seek Him, what the Scripture say? When you seek Him, you'll what? When you knock, it'll be... When you ask, it'll be given. See, the point of the transformation and the point of worship is when we... Seek God, we will find, and when we find God, there's always a transforming experience that we experience with God. Always. You will never find God and not be transformed. You will never find God and not be changed. You will never find Jesus Christ and not have something happen in your life that changes you for the better. It'll never change you for the worse. It'll never change you uh, uh, in a negative way. It will always be for the better. That's just because of who they are. That's just because they're so uh, magnificent. See, God dwells in an atmosphere of worship. The host of heaven worships you, Nehemiah 9, 6 says. So, what does God do while we worship? He knows all things, so our worship doesn't surprise Him. He owns all things, so our gifts don't enrich Him. He's perfect in all His attributes, so our fellowship with Him can't improve Him. What then does God? What then does our worship do for God? Well, we might not be able to explain it, but the Bible declares that God delights in His people and responds to their worship and their obedience. See, worship is an act of obedience when we are brought into the presence of who God is. When we're introduced to His words, when we hear praise songs that lift Him up, it drives us to a place of obedience. See, worship is just not something that you do without a cause. Worship is always instigated by a cause. 
It's instigated by the Word of God or by the Holy Spirit or by your revelation of God who He is. Worship is not something plucked out of the air. It's always instigated by a cause. Let that settle. It's important. And again, we might not be able to explain it, but we know God delights in it. God's divine nature isn't affected by our worship, but His response to our love and His relationship to us in our walk and work are certainly affected. God is our Father, but He can't be a Father to us if we aren't cultivating His love. 2 Corinthians 16, 17 says this, I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. That's relationship, folks. That's God wanting to come in. Not us looking out a kitchen window view of God and saying, boy, that's my daddy out there. It's opening the door and letting daddy come in. Last week I, I preached on, on, on Big Daddy. Wasn't that right? Wasn't that, and, 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 and look, if you're going to have a relationship with your Heavenly Father, you've got to open the door and you've got to let Him in. You've got to dine with Him. You've got to sup with Him. You've got to find uh, about His instruction, about His plans, about His purpose. You've got to hear Him say how much He loves you. Instead of just looking out and saying, boy, it's good, it's beautiful. I love that. I love that. I love that. Let Him in. Let Him in. It'll make a difference. See, worship changes the worshiper. We won't change God. Worship changes you when you encounter God. That's the whole point of it all. You're worshiping, for, you're worshiping God for who He is and what He's done and what He's going to do. You're worshiping Him for a cause and an effect. And it changes you. It doesn't change Him. He's all of those things and will always be those things. He doesn't need to be transformed. He doesn't need to be changed. But boy, we do, don't we? Amen. God looks for those who truly worship Him because He knows through our discovery of Him will be changed. Now I want to give you the five elements that will be present in true worship. Five elements. They're not really hard. They're not really deep. And by the way, I'm through the introduction now. Everybody say amen. Now you get to see some stuff on the screen, all right? Praise the Lord. And see, are, are you understanding what I'm saying? We, we keep God at a distance. And, and it's not a negative view, it's a good view. It's a beautiful view. As a matter of fact, we, we built our spiritual house with that in mind, that we can see God through that view. But let's be honest, how many of us are truly afraid to let God in? And, 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 and in a way that is so profound that it'll change us. And it's okay to be honest, okay? It's okay to say, I am a little bit afraid to totally, totally let God have control of me. Put your hand up. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little bit afraid to open the door and let God have total control of me. Just put your hand up if you think, and be honest. God knows you're lying anyway, amen, if you don't really lift it up. All right, you, you can put it down. Because here's the deal. It will be very evident and obvious in your life and through these five elements if you practice this or not. And if you don't practice this, then you are absolutely afraid to let God in. Or you're resistive. Because when you do this, it's going to cost you some things. When you do this, your will is going to go out the window. When you do this, your purpose is going to go out the window. When you do this, the desires that you once had will change. When you do this, your love of the world is going to change. When you do this the right way and you come in and you let Him in and dine with Him, your pocketbook is going to change. When you do this, your heart will absolutely be the heart that Scripture talks about, that He'll create a new heart in you and put a new spirit in you. Now, you can be honest or you can deny it. But at the end of the day, He knows. And at the end of the day, it will be obvious with what you bring to the table when it comes to worship. I want to give you five elements. Five elements. Because I think it's, this is one thing that we have to, we have to talk about that, that is important. Let's start with spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. First Peter 2 5 says, You also, as living stones, are being built up, uh, being built up a spiritual house. God is building you up a spiritual house. A house that has a window that you can look out of, but it has a door that you can open. He's building you up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable 
to God through Jesus Christ. Now, most of you thought when I talk about spiritual sacrifices that I'd be coming out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. You had no idea that 1 Peter 2, 5 says you were being built up a spiritual house that you would bring spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Most of us do not know what that means. We don't. In 1 John 2, 27, it says this, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. God is building you up a spiritual house, a priesthood. You say, a priesthood? Yeah. You know why this is so foreign? Most, most of us don't feel like priest. Let me just say this to every man in here. You're the priest of your home if you're a born-again believer. And if you're a single parent, ladies, or husbands, or whoever you are, if you're single, you're the priest of your home. And you should, he says, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood, and uh, the, that, that's to offer up spiritual sacrifices to Jesus Christ. And it's foreign to us because we don't really know how to act on that. And they illuminate our ministry. Spiritual sacrifices aren't necessarily non-material sacrifices, although some of them are. The word means of spiritual quality related to the Spirit. A spiritual sacrifice. It's a spiritual quality related to the Spirit. In other words, what we offer is given sincerely to God in the Spirit through Jesus Christ. Then our gifts are acceptable as a spiritual sacrifice. Most everybody likes to equate this to money. This has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with your willingness to offer everything that you have to God as a spiritual sacrifice with a right heart. It's not about an amount. It's not about a thing. It's about what you're willing to do. It's the character and attitude of the giver that gives value to the offering. The poor widow's copper coins brought more joy to the Lord than the rich worshiper's expensive gifts. The rich worshiper come in and filled up those, uh, their 12, tr- uh, 12 cones, or they called them trumpets, but they're really cones in the temple when they come in. They didn't have ushers like we do. I wish we were able to put cones on the wall, but I'm afraid that might not work. And I'm afraid we live in an age where some people might take some out instead of put some in. Or they might want to make change and we'd think they were robbing it and it might not be a pleasant thing, so we just take an offering. Amen? But Jesus was teaching the disciples and they watched some rich people pour in all the coins and it made the money. And of course, that would get everyone's attention. But when the little lady put in her two coins, Jesus said, that woman has given the greatest gift of all because she's opened her heart and made a sacrifice. And we equate spiritual stuff with money because of that. But in reality, what Jesus wasn't talking about, the, see, the money wasn't the issue. The issue was her willingness to give back to God. Some of you need to understand that your time is a spiritual sacrifice when it's done the right way. Not just that you check a box or that you'll get in private and say, they don't understand what I give up to be here today. God understands. He also understands the attitude. Amen? He also understands what is a priority with your time and what's not. Amen? Well, I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen? So it's important that we understand. See, when the church is at worship giving witness to God, some of the things that we should bring, I think, starts with ourselves. It starts with ourselves. It's the most important sacrifice that we can ever give. Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I beg you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul said, it is absolutely not unreasonable for you to live for God. Under the old covenant economy, the worshiper brought a live animal to be slain. It was a dead sacrifice. It was a dead sacrifice. But under the new economy of grace, we are living sacrifices, able to serve the Lord and glorify Him. Let me give you two examples. Two people. Isaac and Jesus. Abraham was taking Isaac. Many people think Isaac was a little boy. Isaac was probably 30 years old when he was being offered up by Abraham as a sacrifice to God. Isaac didn't fight him. He didn't resist. If God wanted his father to sacrifice him, Isaac was willing, as a type of Christ, to lay down and be offered as a sacrifice to God. 
And, of course, we know Christ willingly gave his life. No man took it. He willingly laid it down. That's the attitude. That's the spiritual sacrifice that we're talking about. Those examples. The characteristic of a person who is a living sacrifice is obedient to the Father, willing to yield everything. See, it becomes a picture window or kitchen window view if we're not willing to give it all to God. If we want to hold some back and say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to sacrifice that, then we're saying God's beautiful, God's great, God's good, but I'm not going to let Him in to have His place with my total willingness to let Him have control of my life. You've got to let Him in. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in. Not one negative thing about that. I'll come in and I'll dine with Him. And I'll fellowship with Him. And we'll have a union together. It's incredible. Nothing negative. And see, when we yield everything, there's no arguing or complaining. No explanations are needed or raised to enter into the new kind of life, ministering to the Lord and to others. When we open the door and give God ourself with a spiritual sacrifice, it's important. See, when you start to do that, God starts to bless. God starts to say, that is what I'm looking for. That's what I hear and I find in my child. This is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. Or, wow. Wow. They just don't hear. They do. How many of you parents have ever been proud of your children when they obey? Amen. When they obey. God's the same way. Let me just say this. It starts with giving yourself with a spiritual sacrifice, right attitude, right everything. Don't just look from the window and think about what it would be like. Don't sit out there and say, boy, it's great. I think this, uh, I hear of all these wonderful stories about people whose lives have had these great things done and, and, and God has moved in such a big way. You can have the same thing happen to you if you'll get out of the way from the window and say, I'm going to go to the door and let him come in and say, God, here I am. I'm just going to, you have your way with me. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. It's a living sacrifice. Totally acceptable unto God. And you know what you'll find in that? Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, And you will find the perfect will of God for your life. Instead of sitting there wondering, saying, What's God's will for my life? What, 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 what does God want for me? What does God want me to do? I promise you it starts with first giving yourself totally to God. Because you remember your spiritual house being built up. Let me give you the second element of the five elements that I believe that allow us to worship the way that would be well-pleasing to God. How many want to hear it say amen? amen? Amen. Praise. This is a little bit easier than the first one. But I have found that the people who praise are the people who do the first one. It's easy to praise when you've given yourself to God. And you're not worried anymore, and you're not afraid, and you know God's not going to have you do something totally foreign and totally subjective to you that you're not sure about. You have totally trusted God, and everything that God, that God has done in your life in the past and the present and the future, you feel good about. And you can't help but to praise Him. You understand what I'm saying? People who have difficulty praising are people who have never first given themselves totally to God. Because they know they have not done what they really need to do. They're standing there saying, oh, it's beautiful, it's great, this is a wonderful view. But they've never opened the door and let Him in. And thus, they don't know how to praise. And when it comes time to worship, it's that awkwardness. It's that, what do I do here? I know what I need to do, but I'm not sure if I should do because I haven't done what I've needed to do. Well, let me just say this. If you haven't done the first, try doing the second, and it'll help lead you to the first. Because when you praise God, you get a glimpse of how glorious He is. And when you watch others praise God, you'll get a glimpse of what God has done in their life by the way they praise. Now listen to me. Praise is not always this stuff. It's not running around. It's not what you see on TV. Real praise comes from a heart of gratitude. Real praise comes when we acknowledge God for who He is. It's not what everybody else is doing. It's what God has done with you. You, 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 you don't know what God has done with me. And your praise will not be like my praise. 
But your praise will be praise. And I don't know what God has done with you outside of redemption. But outside of redemption, God has done a whole lot of things for me that make me want to praise Him. God's given me some good kids. I want to praise Him for that. God's given me a wonderful woman. I want to praise Him for that. God's given me a good church. I want to praise Him for that. I have to pray for Him a lot of times, but it's still a wonderful church. God's given me a gift to stand before people and tell about His greatness and His goodness and His love and His kindness and His long-suffering. I want to praise Him for that. God has healed me from cancer. I want to praise Him for that. Amen? God allows me to walk among men in my old age where young men still say, I want to be like the old guy. Amen? I want to praise Him for that. God still allows me to mow my own grass, cut my own bushes, pick up my own garbage, and because I'm able, I want to praise Him for that. Amen? I can still throw a football with my kids and not have to sit in a chair or something. I want to praise Him for that. See, he, you might not have what I'm praising Him for, but my praise is my praise, and I don't need to worry that my praise needs to be like yours because He's done enough good things for me. i got plenty of praise, and I don't need to steal any of yours. But if you praise for what He's done for you and what we all do it. Imagine what the service would be like when we allowed God to come in and we praise Him for what He's done for each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> Hebrews 13, 15, therefore, let Him, uh, therefore, by Him, let us continually, everybody say continually, Offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. If I presented my body to God in worship, then I must use that body to glorify Him. And this is where praise comes in. This is what the host of heaven are doing now and what we shall be doing forever in glory. If my praise is an acceptable spiritual sacrifice, it must come from my heart. It must be voluntary, not forced, and it must be a free, a free will offering to God. You, know, I, you hear these songs, uh, Getting Back to the Heart of Worship, or Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. You think, oh, how did they write that song? Why did they write that song? You know why? There was something void in them when they wrote the song. I don't know about you, but I have to have the eyes of my worship, or the eyes of my heart open so I can worship like I need to be. Or getting back to the heart of worship. The, art of, the heart of worship is not about what we do in the service. It's about who we are worshiping. That's the heart of the worship. Not about what we're doing, it's about who we're singing about. And we recognize who we are singing about and been transformed by that. Now we're getting to the real heart of worship. Not what's been done in here, but what He's already done for us. And who He is. See, that's the heart of it all. So, praise is important. And it's not just praise when we see our, sing our songs. And listen to me. I, I watch today. I watch almost every Sunday. It is awkward for some people with worship music. That's why some people would prefer a hymn book to stay seated. And everybody sing and everybody does the same thing. Because they're not put on the spot. And they want to know what chorus we're going to sing. And it's not going to do anything. And we're all seated. And we're all safe. But when we say stand and let's worship. And now we're singing songs about what God is going to do and has done. And now everybody is on the spot. They're out of the safety of that seat. And now it becomes awkward for some people because worship is foreign to them. Because they've never let Him in. They know He's beautiful. They know He's the Savior. They can identify with Him. They know Him. They know Him if He walks in a distance. They, they know His voice. They know all of that. But they've never really opened the door to let Him come in and dine with Him. There's a big difference. And your praise becomes so different when you sit down and have intimate time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me let you in on a secret. God is already in you. And when you open the door, you're just saying, God, 
Just have control. Tell me what you want me to tell me. Instead of suppressing, which we call the grieving of the Spirit. We grieve the Spirit when we don't do what the Spirit tells us to do. And God is seeking, again, Scripture said He's seeking true worshipers. He's seeking. So praise is essential. Praise is important. And it's not just praising God in a praise service. I don't know why we have to have a service just to praise God. God's done a whole lot more for us than just what we think He's done on the cross. The cross gave you life. His presence gives you the abundant life. Let me say that again. The cross gives you life. His presence gives you the abundant life. You got that? Because He's the good shepherd. Let me give you the third element of the five elements that allow us to worship the way that we do without it being just a kitchen window view. Prayer. Prayer. Psalms 141.2 Let my prayer be set before you as incense, lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, why'd you pick that verse, Pastor Mike? Because I don't have a clue what that means. I can't relate to that. Well, if you read the Psalms, you can learn a little bit about it. Psalms 141.2, here's the reference. The reference is this. There is, an old, uh, there is a golden altar of incense that stood before the veil when David wrote this psalm in the holy place of the sanctuary, of the tabernacle. Each morning and evening, the priest would trim the lamps and they would burn incense on the golden altar right before the veil. Now, inside the veil, this was called the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. You're still with me now, right? There'd be a morning time when the wicks would be trimmed and the incense would be burned to make sure it was continual. There'd be a time in the evening when it would burn. The incense would be on the golden altar. The only offering that was permitted on that altar was the incense that was to be trimmed and to be burning at all times. It was to be a perpetual incense before the Lord. Exodus 30 verse 8, the incense symbolizes the prayers of God's people. It's symbolic of prayer, and it's always before the throne of God. God specified it would be a golden altar showing the importance of prayer to Him. Its position is next to the Holy of Holies and underscores its importance even more than that. Prepared incense is useless without fire. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. The posture of the body isn't important as the posture of the soul. People say, how do we pray? We always say we pray. We bow our heads, we do this, we do this in a certain way. You know what? That's really not important. You know what's important? Where is your soul? Where are you before God in your prayer? You say, well, I've heard that prayer doesn't change God. It does not. God uses prayer to change you. That's what part. That's why it's part of the element of worship. You don't pray enough, then guess what? You don't worship enough. Prayer is essential to worship. Prayer is something you do in private, and that way when you come into the corporate worship, you're ready. You're ready to give the presence of God on you. Have you ever prayed and wept? I used to feel so bad. I'd pray sometimes when I'd preach, or I'd just start crying when I'd preach, and I'd feel like I'm such a weenie. I'm a goober. I shouldn't, why, why should I cry? And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit revealed, because I am speaking to you and you are listening and it's transforming you. It is humbling you. It is speaking to you. It is something you see that has substance that's so real. And you know what I cry for now? I cry, Lord, just take my heart and use it. I'll just be a spiritual weenie. As long as my soul is in good standing before you. Amen. And see, prayer is so important. The prepared incense is useless without the Holy Spirit. The posture of the body isn't as important as the posture of the soul. And there are many ways to pray. Many ways to pray. Let me also be careful about this too. If you're in a family unit, don't let one person do all the praying. Because the other people get lazy spiritually. Amen? I know we have the same habit. We tend to pick on Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah is the youngest, and we tell Jeremiah to pray. Jeremiah, you want to pray? Yes, sir. He never says no. Yes, sir. And you might think that Jeremiah, see, we, I think we started doing it because he'd pray fast because he's little and he don't know a lot. And we can eat quick, right? You understand the reasoning behind that, all you spiritual people, amen? I mean, the food's here and we want somebody to pray and we think he'll be a little awkward. He'll be, son, Jeremiah will start rattling off the Ten Commandments, man. He'll start talking about all the things of God. He'll, start to, he'll be praying about the cousins and this and thanking God for my family, thanking for my mom and dad, thanking for my teacher, thanking for the food, thanking for this. And I mean, he'll just go on and on. Have you ever done this? You've been praying and you kind of peek up that eye and you say, okay, dude, hurry up. <laughs> but what it does, it makes the rest of us lazy. Can I get an amen? I think it should be a a, a take turn kind of thing. Today is your turn. Tomorrow is your turn. You know why? It forces us to get into the presence of God. Isn't it funny sometimes how you'll be praying for the food and all of a sudden you'll hear a lip quiver and a tear will roll down a cheek. There I go again. And you're supposed to be praying for the food. And God will get a hold of somebody's heart. And all of a sudden, you ain't worried about the food. You're worried about what's being prayed about. You know why? You've been brought in the presence of God through prayer. And let me tell you something. That's worship. That's precious time. That's incredible opportunity. And God is so well pleased with that because it's on the golden altar. It sets before the Holy of Holies. And God wants us to always be in an attitude of prayer. Always. We say, what does that mean? That means whenever we think we need to, just talk to Him. It's not formal. Just talk to Him. Well, let me give you the fourth thing. I said there were five elements. Time's going well. Sermon's going well. I've admitted I'm a weenie. Amen. Amen. I love you too. You can all be weenies like me. Amen. We'll be a pack of weenies together, all right? But I've always found you get a pack of weenies, you know what you can make with that? Hot dogs. Amen. Hot dogs for the Lord. Amen. See, that's Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them to love God who call according to purpose. Amen. You can be a spiritual weenie and weep and cry and several people do it and all of a sudden you'll be a pack of weenies next thing you know, you'll all be hot dogs for God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that deserves a hand clap. It should be. Amen. (laughs) Element of worship. I'm just teaching you how to worship a little bit. I'm teaching you because I've had to learn the hard way. I'm not teaching you because I learned this in school. I learned this because I have caught myself many times looking out that kitchen window, talking about how amazing the things of God are, but in reality, I really needed to open the door and let Him in. I really did. Here's the fourth one. Element of worship. Service and giving. Uh Uh-oh. See, you can't do this with a kitchen window view. (laughs) You can't just serve thinking about it. You can only serve by doing it. Let me let it sink in. You can't just serve thinking about it. You can serve by doing it. It may look pretty, but it won't be effective. You can think about serving, and it'll look good. It'll smell good. It'll do all those things, but it won't be effective until you let Him in. Hebrews 13, 16 says, But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Hmm. Christian service must be an act of worship, otherwise it will become a terrible burden. Whether we're teaching the Word, sweeping the floor, visiting the sick, our motive must be to please and glorify the Lord. I don't care what you do in this church. If your motive is not to do it because you love the Lord and because you're worshiping Him, I'm going to just say this as boldly as I know how, as sincerely as I know how, but with no malice, If it's not for that purpose, if it's a burden to you, you need to quit. 
You say, well, nobody else will be able to do it. I bet you're wrong. I bet you're wrong. God will always supply somebody. And you know what will happen? You're going to miss out. You know what will happen? You'll miss it when you give it up. You know what will happen? You'll be sorry you ever gave it up. You know what will happen? You'll get discouraged and the enemy will start attacking you like a big dog. Anytime you quit, the enemy jumps on your back because now you're prey to him. If you don't do it for the right reasons, give it up. You say, wait a minute, you told me don't quit. Okay, do it for the right reasons. And then you won't quit. Amen? See, our service has to be an act of worship or it will become a burden. Christian giving must also be an act of worship. Rather, we're putting uh, an offering envelope in the plate or opening up our home. Whether we're being kind to somebody, it has to be an act of worship. Too often, our giving is motivated by guilt. You're not going to find many pastors that will tell you if you feel guilty about putting money in the offering plate, don't do it. I'm going to tell you, if you're feeling guilty or you're doing it and saying, man, I, I wish I didn't have to do this. I wish this wasn't a requirement. I'm just saying, don't give. Because you ain't going to get any benefit from it. God loves a cheerful giver. If it's a burden to you, if it's something that causes you harm, don't do it. Don't do it. Now, how many pastors are going to get up and tell you that? No, I'm telling you because you know what's going to happen if you don't do it? God's going to chasten those whom He loves. I promise you. Because we're talking about worship. It has to be an act of worship. In other words, it'll show what you truly, really do worship. Do you worship Him or do you worship the offering that you really feel guilty about giving? Whoa. Whoa. Sometimes our giving is motivated by guilt. 2 Corinthians, 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's all I'm going to say. Don't need to say anymore. By the way, when you give, you don't give to bless me. You give to bless him. When you give, I don't get a bonus because we had a big offering. We don't give bonuses to the staff because the offering was bigger. We all get a set salary. It never changes. It is what it is. It is what it is. But when you do give, instead of us getting the bonus, when you give, you know what you get? You get a bonus. Your spiritual bank account increases. Your treasure in heaven multiplies. And you find God showing up doing things for you that you didn't think would happen. And this is what that little song is about, little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it when you go in Jesus' name. It's important that you understand when you give and you don't give grudgingly, don't worry about not having what you need. God will supply and multiply your need because of your obedience and your sacrifice. He always does. You're his child. He's not going to let you down. He's got your back. Let me give you the last one. This is the one closest to my heart of all of these. Because really without this one, those other four are not going to matter too much. I want to be honest with you. If you experience this, everything else will fall into place. The fifth element of worship is a broken heart. A broken heart. I'm being a weenie again. Psalms 51. David wrote Psalms 51. Out of great tragedy in his life. He knew what these words meant. Verses 16 and 17. For you do not desire. This is David praising the Lord. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings because he had tried all that. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. 
See, we get so full of ourselves sometimes that our heart never breaks. Our pride gets so big that we think that, that, that we'll lower ourselves if we allow God to come in and break our heart. So we stand at that kitchen window and we look out that view and we say God is good. And God's not going uh, uh, not gonna to do anything negative. He's good, he's, he, he's gracious, He's kind, He's forgiving, and He's all of those things. But let me tell you, when you let God in, and in that time when He comes in and dines with you, and He starts to reveal His goodness and what He did for you. And see, through that, you discover that your sin is what Christ died for. And it'll break your heart in true worship. It'll break your heart. And worship that's not really true, and worship that you're not sure about, worship that is distant, it won't break your heart. It'll still look good. It'll still have a nice vision about it. But when you let Him into your heart, and you start revealing what He has done for you, and what He is willing to do for you, and what we do for Him, it will break your heart. And sin will break your heart. Because it's sin that put Him on the cross. It was sin that made Him lay down His life for you because He loved you so much. It's sin that will allow you to be distanced from a love that's so encompassing that when you experience it, it changes everything about you. That's a broken heart. This is perhaps the most costly of the spiritual sacrifices that we talked about. And people are afraid to let their heart be broken. But let me tell you something. When God breaks your heart, it is a good thing. Because you will absolutely know when your heart is broken that your sins have been forgiven. It won't be, oh, I'm sorry. It won't be, man, I, I, I'm just, I really feel bad because I did something wrong. No, a broken heart means that you will never do it again because you'll see the beauty of who He is. And how much harm it has caused. God has done special blessings for those who cultivate a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. And in the church age today, we never hear that. We never hear it taught. We're, we're, all we're hearing is everybody's good and everything is great. And keep doing what you're doing. And God is long-suffering and this. But let me tell you, when you encounter God with true worship, it will break your heart. It'll also break your heart when you worship and realize what He's done for you and you look at other people and you realize they need exactly what God has done for you and your heart will break for them. There's no place in worship for cold, hard hearts. There's no place for that. It's the most costly Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, Thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. You know one of the things that breaks my heart? is when I realize I have not obeyed God's Word. Or when I've let God down. And it breaks my heart. See, some, some people don't care what the Word of God says, and they keep doing what they want to do. When you take the Word of God seriously, it will break your heart when it comes to worship. This is the Lord speaking to you, His Word. Psalms thirty four eighteen. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Psalms 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Praise God for that. Isaiah 57.15, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible what the Lord says. I'm going to say again what I said in the beginning. When I worship, I would rather my heart 
be without words than my words be without heart. When your heart is broken, your worship will be different. And your attitude toward God will be a very humble attitude. A very open attitude where God will come in. I'm going to close. I'm going to ask Kenny to come. When we worship God, we should bring to Him a broken heart and a humble spirit. The more we worship, the more our hearts are humbled before Him. There is no room for pride in the presence of the Lord. Worship involves witness, and witness begins with our witnessing to God. In doing so, we glorify Him. That's why I call it celebration. Worship is celebration for who God is and what God has done. I'm going to ask you to bring the lights down, Ryan. Because I said in this in worship, worship starts with us giving ourselves back to God. Those five elements are, are, are something every person in here can do, but you've got to be willing to do it. You got, you're, you know, that you're, you're at that window and you're looking out and I can see the place we have and I, I have this image of how beautiful everything looks looking out that window. What needs to be done and what we've just done. And, but boy, when that door opens and we bring that outside in or we let Jesus in, everything changes. I want you to bow your heads right now. And this is the only thing I'm going to ask in this service because I, 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 that's why I ask you to raise your hand if you were a believer. I've been talking to believers here today. I've been talking to my brothers, my sisters in Christ. I've been talking to my friends, my family. I've been, I've been talking as, as a pastor who loves his people. And, and believe me, I, I have tried to reveal my heart to you this morning. Because I, I really do care about you. And because I know, I know, you got to believe me, I know what it's like when you don't let him in. And I know what it's like when you do let him in. And I'm going to ask that God will speak to every heart in this place that you will give yourself back to God today. I know you're redeemed. I know you're saved. I know you love God. But there's so many that are looking at it through a kitchen window view instead of opening the door and letting him in and let him dine and sup and share with you. I'm going to ask just to give yourself back to God today with a new attitude of worship, with a new, a new attitude of being. And ask God to speak to you. Maybe break your heart. Maybe, maybe you've got so many things that you need to praise Him for. But whatever it is, just do it today. I want you to bow your heads as I pray. And if God is moving you to come to this altar, let's stand. Again, it makes us feel uncomfortable when we stand because the safety in sitting means we don't have to do anything. But the moment we stand, we know now we're in a position to do. I want you to stand as I pray for you. You've got to open the door. You've got to take that step. You've got to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. I'm going to give myself to you today. I'm going to be a living sacrifice. I'm going to give myself back to you. I'm going to quit looking from a distance and I'm going to come in and I'm going to, talk, I'm going to experience what Pastor Mike's talking about. I pray, I pray that God will speak to every one of you and pride won't be in this place and God will use this moment, this day, to change you as you surrender back to Him. You come as God would have you do. Father, I pray for everybody in this place right now. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that they would move and that they would come and say, Lord, just take me, use me, mold me, shape me. Lord, not that there's a sin issue. Not that there's a we're bad people issue. We just want to worship You and we want to start by giving ourselves to You. Lord, I pray that You'll speak to every heart in this place. I pray that You'll move on people who right now know they need to move and they won't move. I pray the Holy Spirit would speak in this awkward moment that they'd just step out and say, Lord, I want to come. Uh, I pray for those that have never been to an altar. They've never been to an altar. Lord, I pray that they'd experience the altar today. They'd just come. They'd try to do it. They'd, they'd try to receive. I pray for them in Jesus' name.
Amen. Now, look, slip out of your seat and come. Slip out of your seat and say, Lord, just take me, use me like you've never used me before. I'm going to let you in. You've never been to an altar? Come try it. You've never been to an altar? Just come. It'll change you. It will. You say, I'm a visitor. Visitor, you can come. You say, I'm not a church member. Non-church members, you can come. You come. This is about you and God. This is about you worshiping God. You come. You examine your heart and say, what voids do I have in my life where God can fill the void? You just come and let God have His way. Amen. 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 See, this is, again, you say, boy, I feel awkward. I feel like I don't know what to do. Just do what God would tell you to do. And you won't feel awkward. Amen? You won't feel awkward. Just come and do what God would have you to do. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray for these that are at the altar. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to their hearts. They realize there's a void. They realize there's a need. They want to they want to dine with you. They want to fellowship with you. They want to be close to you. And Lord God, have your way in their life. I thank you for them coming. I thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to this audience today. And I pray that we'd all be moved to worship you in a better way. Break our hearts. Let us pray more. Let us praise more. Let us serve and give and let us be the living sacrifice that we need to be so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus. Well, Father, I also ask that our fellowship and our life would be more abundant as we journey with you and have relationship with you. It would be more abundant. We thank you for our salvation. But Father, we want that abundant presence in our life that only comes with worship. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap if you would this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being so attentive. Thank you for allowing me to share. Uh, I want to compliment all of our, our young people here this morning that filled out their bulletin. You turn it in at the coffee bar, they got a prize for you. You deserve it. You've done well. And be sure to thank Miss Jennifer for, for providing that bulletin for you. Hug somebody's neck before you leave. And be here on Wednesday. We're going to speak to you again. God bless you. You're dismissed. Amen.